Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Contractor Evolution. This is Benji, and my guest on the show today is Kyle Nitchin. Now, I found Kyle through his Substack and newsletter called The Influential Project Manager. Kyle has built over $350 million worth of hospital wings, surgery rooms, urgent care centers, all sorts of really cool high-end healthcare-related stuff uh, throughout Los Angeles as a senior project manager for Layton Construction. And he writes about, talks about, thinks about all things construction leaders and project management on his Substack, which is worth subscribing to, by the way. Um, and today, we talk about a few things. We get into why project management in the construction industry is as big of a dumpster fire as it is. We talk about how much of the modern tools and methods from Gantt charts to critical paths, while useful, are somewhat incomplete in today's construction environment and what to do instead. And lastly, he takes us through the seven archetypes of effective project managers, a super useful framework to help you develop your own PMs. So let's dive in with Kyle. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Kyle, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem, Benji. Thanks for having me on. Okay, let's talk uh, Let's talk wardrobe really quick first. So today's wardrobe is brought to you by Craftsman Renovations. Craftsman is owned by Jeremy Stubbs. Uh, residential renovations, general contracting, custom carpentry, member since 2000, 2017. He's been a Breakthrough Academy member for like six, almost seven years now. He works with Coach Dan Stav uh, in the Master's Circle group. That's our high-performance group. And I was talking to him this morning. I asked for one big challenge in his business and one big win. So one big challenge that they're focused on this year is relationship marketing. He was telling me that the data, like the sales data that they're tracking is showing that a lot of their best work, their highest paying customers, the people that pay on time, they're also easy to sell. They also refer them more. They all come from referrals. It's very, very clear in their lead source tracking. And so what they're going to do this year is double down on that. They want to have two new professional relationships added to their CRM per month. So that's like designers, engineers, uh, architects, stuff like that. So that's their big focus. It's a challenge trying to overcome this year. And then a big win recently, he was telling me, um, they actually just helped a really long-term uh, team member, an employee of theirs, transition out of the business. He had kind of grown as much as he could inside of Craftsman. They had a really tight relationship, close friendship, worked together for many years. They found him a better opportunity um, and they found a replacement to take that role from him. Uh, and so it was a win-win for everyone. So before we jump into this conversation with Kyle, guys, um, if you want to work with the best coaches in the industry, you want to work with like 600 other entrepreneurs in the best ecosystem uh, in North America, entrepreneurs like Jeremy, check out Breakthrough Academy. Go to www.b like Benji, t like Thomas, academy.com. Okay, let's dive in, Kyle. Um, so you were sending me this report, this FMI labor productivity report from last year. And there's some pretty like shocking, shocking figures here. It's saying <laughs> that they estimate there's 30 to $40 billion lost every single year or lost last year due to poor productivity. And they zoom in and they actually say three of the top four contributing factors were poor planning, poor communication, and poor collaboration. So do you want to maybe just unpack that or, or give your thoughts to this, this report that you sent me? Yeah. Yeah, exactly like you said, Benji. It's a pretty jarring and eye-opening report and something that I've experienced the last, you know, 10 plus years uh, doing this, managing projects of, of complex size. Really any project, though, falls into these kind of categories. Um, and like, like you said, they've narrowed it down through their survey and report of, of poor planning, poor communication and, and collaboration. I think some of those reasons is because construction, like, unlike other industries is very unique. It's unique in how every project and every site is its own prototype, right? Mm. Um, 
every team, every every project you travel to, you have a different team. Very unlike other industries where people go to the same office, they're working at the same place, they have the same problems, the same challenges, the same customers, the same team members that they're working with. Well, that's not the case here. So communication and leadership and collaboration is is ultra emphasize those kind of skills. And the stuff that we're dealing with is very, it's not straightforward, right? It's its not uh, clear, it's changed, it's highly variable. There's waste everywhere. And it really takes like a special kind of effort, a special kind of approach, and maybe a unique in types of individuals to kind of string it all together and kind of look at the process that applies to that project in that specific situation and bringing all the people together to get on the same page and making sure that everyone's productive in that overall system. So it's really unique in in like that. So that to me is kind of where what I've experienced and and to it it was clear in that report as well. Mhm. I um <clears throat> I see all signs pointing to bad project management here. I mean, like we could we could uh, potentially point to different things and say it's this. Well, no, it's that. And no, it's this other thing. If you look at, you know, what's the common denominator behind planning, communication and collaboration? It is sort of uh, the craft and the science of project management. So so to give you like kind of a simple question to, to just brainstorm with me on, like what is fundamentally wrong with project management in construction today? I think there is a, there is, like you said, it's not really the project manager or it's not the, it could be the project executive, or it's really the project leadership team, right? So there is a kind of a disconnect between like planning and doing, um, there's a lack of skill level that could be involved there. You know, so there's people in the leadership project leadership positions that maybe not necessarily qualified for that. And we have like shortages in that area. There's skilled labor shortages. There's late shortages on the management side as well. Um, there's different systemic issues with that are creating like a, a kind of like a bureaucracy that's uh makes it hard to govern these kind of these kind of projects. Um, and and yeah, there's just this overall gap between planning and doing, and kind of to go back on the point where it's very un, a unique environment. Like we're we're in charge of managing these these things. It's just a bunch of humans, and when humans are involved in these complex things things get complicated. You know, there's, there's biases that we're all programmed with. And, um, and, and when those, and it's, it's really a, a combination of a bunch of decisions that are being made over time. And when humans are involved in that with, you know, prides and egos and, and goals, certain things, things can get out of a line and kind of go down the wrong path. And when, once they go down the wrong path, things can kind of compound and I've seen it, I've experienced it. And, um, that's when these issues start to happen. You know, schedules get blown out of the water, budgets start to rise. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of new information about that too. And I'd recommend a book to the audience if they want to learn more about that concept, be how big things get done. Um, check that book out. That book goes into great detail about, um, about the current practices of project management. One of them being, um, we tend to deliver projects in a way where we uh, think slow and act fast. Um, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Think fast and act slow. Mm. So we we rush through the planning phases all excited to get into a project um, only to find ourselves delivering very slowly because we didn't plan properly, mm -hmm. right? Where the opposite strategy, the philosophy would be to think slow so you can act fast, create a really detailed, good plan that's really thorough, tested, thought out. You've thought of all the downside. You've, you've vetted all your plans. And that way, when you go into the delivery mode, which is the riskiest part of the business, um, you know, getting under construction, um, you can move fast, move with speed and energy and get, get right through that window. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing and experiencing, I think, in today's environment. Can you talk a little bit more about the the idea of a, a gap between planning and doing? Like that really leapt off the page to me where it's like, 
there's massive distance between where the decisions around design, materials, timelines, budgets, all these incredibly pertinent and important details. There's decisions are 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 made about that with incredible distance from the actual place it happens. So maybe just expand on that point and and really twist the knife here. Like why why is that such a problem? What kind of downstream issues does it create? Yeah. So. And this started, uh, the separation between planning and doing started kind of early in the, in the 1900s um, in an effort to, to make things more productive. Um, and what I mean by that is that essentially you, the old school model of, of developing a set of plans um, and then sending that, those set of plans out to the market to get bid on and then to go execute based on that bid, select a, select a contractor and then go execute. It's the classic design bid build delivery model. Now we're seeing it, we're seeing new delivery models pop up nowadays, which is great. And, and that's where we want to be like design build and integrated project delivery and lean construction and, and things of that nature. But it's, it's, it's the minority. It's still the minority in today's case. So design to build, the issue with that is that all the planning and design work and really the key decisions that are being made in a project are happening way before anyone with the building knowledge or the construction knowledge, the people who are actually putting the work in, they're not having any involvement or they're seeing it for the first time. Now, if you look at a graph, <clears throat> where you have, you know, on one axis, you know, your ability to influence the project and time the on the X axis, your ability to influence it is so much greater at the beginning of a project. But once that project, like I said, gets into delivery mode, your ability to influence the outcomes dr dramatically decreases. Mm -hmm. So that is the fundamental issue there between that and, and when you kind of bring that, uh, you know, the doing closer to the to the planning or even to wind it up into the planning phase bring people that have the construction knowledge that you need to get your project done you'll see <clears throat> dramatic outcome a different outcome so for because of that for the types of businesses that we work with who are doing like larger average ticket like builds and 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 you know, I, I spoke to kind of your background in, in in the intro. Like our our listeners are for the most part not doing projects at the scale and scope and price tag that you are. You're market, working on massive, massive stuff, um, but the fundamentals are still the same, right? There, there's still a schedule. Yes. There's still a budget. There's still a customer who has emotions. Um, yep. There's still weather. There's still supply chain issues. There's still a labor force. I mean, it's it's, it's just it's just a, a question of scale. So all, like th this stuff still applies for yep. a business owner like that. I'm thinking um, a design build firm, a custom home builder, um, a spec home builder, uh, maybe landscape construction where they're doing large yards, large retaining walls. Uh, an industrial painter, commercial painter, anyone that's doing larger projects. So this maybe doesn't apply to like a window cleaner. No offense to the window cleaners listening, but you're building larger scale stuff. What's the solution to that? Are you just are you bringing your your project managers, your 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 laborers into design meetings? I mean, it seems cumbersome. Like, is there a practical way to just like make? Sh is there a practical way for our listeners to shrink the gap between planning and doing? Yeah, I think it would be a to first start with maybe building the awareness with your clients or customers and and having these more important conversations early on in the process. So when it comes to defining goals and the outcomes, get real into the nitty gritty on on what what you want and and like having these conversations earlier in the process, bringing the right people to the table. Um, don't don't get into your our, our hardwired optimism bias, which we all have, we, we're all everything when a project starts, we're all happy, we're all excited, we're all thinking our cup's half full, this is going to go well. Maybe take more of a, a try and be practically optimist, optimistic mm -hmm. um, and kind of watch your downside and look at the risks and create a little plan for those risks and, and how you're going to address them. Um, so that's what I would think would be a great start for 
for the people at that scale. And like I said, it's, it's still applicable to those. You still have all the divisions. You still have all the scope. You still have all the, the human dynamics that are on any uh, large scale project. We were talking offline about this idea of there being sort of three eras to the, uh, the school of thought around, uh, around project management and uh, you'd sort of, in broad strokes, it was sort of like there was an era of productivity from the year 1900 to 1950. There was an era of predictability from 1950 to 2000. And we're now entering, albeit poorly and somewhat slowly and with some real growing pains, we're, we're growing into this third era, which is focused more on profitability. Can you maybe just like lay out for us the evolution of the school of project management over the last hundred some odd years, just to give our listeners a little bit more context around where all this, where Gantt charts and critical paths and all this thinking came from in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do a broad overview. Um, for the listeners. And if, if they want to go deeper on that, um, I can recommend a book at that. But basically in the early 1900s from 1900 to 1950 was the, what, um, the first era that you mentioned, the first era, which is the era of predictability. And, and that was the focus productivity. back then of productivity, my bad. Yes. And the focus back then was to, how can we get each individual scope and each individual person to work efficiently as possible. And, it, and that came from a gentleman um, named Frederick Taylor, who pioneered uh, a concept called scientific uh, management, where he looked at each each component and tried to make everyone as, as efficient as possible. Mm. And also Henry Gantt was, was uh, critical in that time who created the Gantt chart and which is a nice visual tool of how to plan and align tasks to to timelines, and it was it was great back then. It was it was revolutionary back then. That wasn't there, but that was where the big separation from planning and doing began, and from there it compounded, um, and that that was transformed and brought into the construction industry, which typically it it wasn't that successful, um, and we still have that glimpse of that in today's environment. Mm -hmm. And from there, from 1950 to 19 or to the 2000, that is the second era, um, the era of predictability. And that's where uh, the critical path method was published, um, which we is still a current standard in today's construction mm -hmm. delivery methods. And but that right there was what created and the foundation for the iron triangle, the infamous iron triangle, which was uh, cost, uh, schedule and scope. And one could influence the other. You can't have all three, but you could have two of the three. That was that was the whole premise of that. And that, again, compounded um, the separation of planning and doing. And then construction management came into the picture where general contractors who once were actually you know, actually producing work, they separated from that and became just um, managers of the work. They were just strictly CM firms. And again, that created another layer um, from the actual doing. So over time, we just got further and further away from actually designing, making and building things to administration, just, you know, legal, ri uh, managing risk and procurement and HR and, and compliance and paperwork like that, that's became what focus and the universities and everything, they taught that they started right. creating programs in education. I got, I got an education in that. So we were essentially taught the administration. We weren't taught how to actually do the work. And so we got separated from that. So from that became what we talked about at the beginning of this, uh, you know, less and less knowledge of actually the how and more about the what and the when. Now yeah. there's this there's this third era that it sounds like we're str we're struggling to get into, which is uh, which is focused on profitability. And the term that that was on this this report that you sent over was like project as a production system, and the idea being how do we deliver business objectives using the fewest amount of resources. Now many organizations, many companies may not be there yet. So we're kind of talking about the ideal versus the, the lived reality. I, I know there's still a gap, but what, what, how is this new era uh, meant to exist and meant to function in a perfect world? Yeah. So that is actually 
you know, the new era, which is getting back to the roots of the how. How is the process? How do we make steel and deliver it? And, and how does the steel guy tie in with the concrete guy? And how does their production systems work together to make this project, which is an overall just a, 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 a like a... Uh, an assemblage of, of mm -hmm. different systems to create this one temporary system. Um, and it's viewing it through those lenses. So mm -hmm. when you, when you put on those different lenses and you add in these different levers, um, you can, you gain a new set of control over your project and you start making decisions differently. Um, and the goals start to change a little bit. Now, it's starting to happen. It's, it's, we've seen it. Like I said, there's integrated project delivery methods that are coming out on the market. They're proven to be effective, but it's, it's not quite mainstream yet. And if you want to go deeper on this whole history and this whole topic, it's beautifully laid out in a book called Built to Fail by Todd Zabel. Hmm. It is the best resource and out there of, of the explanation of, of those current problems. G give us the Coles notes of it. It's it's right there. He just starts with breaking down the era one, two, and three right. and leads into how the production system works and how to create an intelligent production system. Yeah. Is there anything like – are there any – um, new methodologies, new tools, new ways of thinking, new paradigms, new delivery methods. I mean, you mentioned lean construction. You mentioned something else. Like, is there anything that's out there on the market in the in the current thoughtosphere that you look at that you're like, you know, that's actually pretty good. That shows some promise. Yeah, I bet a bunch, several lean construction methodologies, like the last planner system. Are you familiar with that one? Have you heard of that? I'm not. Give us an overview. So. The last planner system is a lean production, uh, a production control method. It's a process where you involve the last planners on your project to help schedule and plan your work. So instead of the guys in the office just creating a schedule and sending it out to people and say, hey, this is when I need you to be done. Uh, let, I don't care. Just get it done. It's involving the foreman of the HVAC company, the plumber, the concrete guy, bringing them in a room either digitally using some digital tools like uh, digital pool planning and collaboration tools or bringing them in your trailer or your office saying, hey, let's 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 grab this schedule here. Here's the milestone that I committed to with my customer wherever we need to be done for this phase or for the overall project. And let's work backwards from it. And let's talk about the resources that you need to complete what you need to do. Let's talk about the handoffs of, hey, once you're done, who's next? Um, when's that going to be done? And let's make promises to each other that um, we're all going to do this and we're going to show up with the manpower, the materials and the information we need so that when we that we're going to be successful when we go and put that work in place the mm -hmm. first time. So that's the last planner system. It's a combination of of you know, pull planning, uh, communication, and, and also analyzing your success. So part of that system, you would, you would meet the next week and say, okay, how did we do on the promises that we made to each other um, last week? Well, the drywaller held 90% of his promises. The HVAC guy held 60% of his promises, but the concrete guy, he was 10%. Okay, let's dig into the why of that and let's understand that. Um, what happened? Oh, you know, I had a breakdown and I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, get my materials on time. Okay. Let's understand why. Cause next week we need to improve. Um, and it's just creating a process of continuous improvement. So that's one example and one framework that, that I love to use and use on, on every job, um, that brings kind of the production back into the conversation rather than just the administration type stuff. Mm-hmm. If you could wave a magic wand, which obviously you can't, so this is truly a hypothetical thought exercise, but if you could, let's just go there, but like, just humor me. If you could wave a magic wand and, and fix three things about how project management is done in construction in North America right now, what, what would they be? Number one, I would fix um, us for getting back to focusing on production, all right? Thinking about the how as thinking about the how and the process and optimizing that process as much as we can rather than 
the administration stuff. You think there's too much, there's too much, there's too much intention. There's too much focus put on admin pencil pushing bureaucratic work. And, there, and there's actually like a, a knowledge gap or an effort gap on the, on the actual job site, like where the actual work happens, where the actual building comes together. Yes, there is. Um, now I'm not saying the other stuff has value because it does. Don't overlook the other stuff. It's, it's important too, but it's, it's, it's overemphasized is what I'm saying. Okay. And it, 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 you know, we're overlooking another big component that, that adds to these compounding issues of, of really what everybody wants is to get their project done, right? Yeah. To get their project done, to do it right, and to have a good time doing it. Okay, so take his focus, take focus away from the admin towards the production. That's the first thing. What what's the second wish? My wish, because I might be a little biased on it, but I leadership, you know, leadership and and putting people first in this process. So really we should be doing all this stuff because we respect each other. You know, we respect each other's time. We respect each other's uh, work. And it sucks when you have a guy that's worked his butt off and he's just got to rip it all out or it's wrong or it's, it's, it's no good. It's, it's demoralizing for the project. And I've been in, I've seen it. It's, it's tough. What's the third thing? And the third one is rebranding this industry to make it more appealing for the younger generation. So right now we have a workforce that's retiring at a at a very fast rate and we don't have the backfill from the younger generation that's replacing those people retiring so it's creating a huge gap so we're we're going to see this <clears throat> come about in in the years to come because it's is happening currently right now um so we have to make the industry more appealing uh, more attractive and more promising for these Gen Z and younger generations coming here that this is a great career. We can do some, we build some awesome things and um, we can, it's a career that's worthwhile and you can make it, make a good living and live a good life. This is potentially a whole other episode or a whole other series of episodes. In fact, it's it's probably an entire other podcast you could you could devote to this. But but do you have any just just high level thoughts on how how we do that? I mean, this is a very sort of well used and well worn soundbite. We really have to appeal to young people. It's like I agree, hundred percent. It's easier said than done. A any any insight on on an approach to doing that? Yeah. Um... Easier said than done, um, but I would say it starts with a, a good marketing effort from a lot of a lot of us in the industry. I think construction companies, um, anyone who really touches the industry at at any level. Um, I saw a Home Depot ad that was during one of the national college football games. It was phenomenal um, promoting the the skilled trades, and that one was excellent. I thought it was great. I think we should see more stuff like that from from companies. And I think that maybe construction companies need to adapt to newer ways of marketing. From for the most part, what I see is, you know, construction marketing is pretty polished. It's it's pretty, you know, mm, polished and traditional. I would say. Mm -hmm. I think we could see a little bit more creative, mm -hmm. uh, creative edge come to it. Maybe that, a little more untucked. More untucked. Some you know stuff that other industries and in, um, are doing and then have been doing. Yeah. I don't know if we've seen that in the industry yet. That was the ad. The, the Home Depot ad is it was interesting. It was uh, it was during a college game, and I think it was basically, uh, you know, run during halftime. Um, mm -hmm. And it was saying it was like it, it you know it had a number on the screen. It was like you know forty or four hundred, and it was saying like open college spots on like the varsity football team, or the, this is how many available positions there are to be like you know, a college, uh, a college football player. And then it had like some massive, like 4,000 or 40,000 or 400,000, you know, open positions and skilled trades. And it was just kind of trying to sh show yeah. the audience that there's massive opportunity there. And I, I love movements like that. And I think that when, when big brands are, are, are spending money, uh, to advertise, uh, not only is it good for Home Depot, but it's a great message to get across. Um, I want to move on to this, this idea. So for those, for those of you listening, Cal's got a really great uh, newsletter and a great sub stack called the Influential Project Manager, right? 
Um, and there, I was, I was kind of poking around on this last week. There was this really, really great blog that I just read through the whole thing, uh, called the seven archetypes of effective project managers. And I wondered if, if we could just spend, you know, 15 minutes here going through these second, these seven archetypes, what are they? Why did you kind of build this or write about this? Why is it a useful way to think about your project managers? Because, because the, 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 just to kind of tie this into this conversation, what we're trying to do here is, is help our listeners build that project management muscle within their business. And I think that's a good way to yeah. think about it. Like this is a muscle. Like it's a combination of people, systems, methodologies. It comes together and, you know, just like after two years of deadlifting, you can lift a lot. Um, after two years of working on this in your business, you can project manage a lot better than you could before. And so I think that I, I found this seven archetypes thing a useful ingredient in trying to develop that muscle. But I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah. So the seven archetypes um, is a framework they developed for exactly what you said. This The project management business and what we do delivering these projects is is complex. It's complicated. Like I said, there's behaviors, there's people, there's biases, there's decisions. And the role of delivering and managing these projects is really diverse. It, it takes like a wide set of skills that that is tough to, to communicate, it's tough to quite understand. And, and there's a lot of nuance in the whole process. So um, this framework first. What, uh, let's define what an archetype is. An archetype is a is a like a, a a behavior model. It's a model that we can use to learn and understand each other, right? So we've heard in stories like the archetype of the hero, right? We can picture and understand what that is, and we can we can grasp that, or the villain, or the shadow, and we can understand these concepts. So I developed these. Um, these set of behaviors for the the diverse set of things that we manage and control and we need to be aware of on a project. Mm -hmm. And it serves as a good framework for project managers or executives or business owners to make sure that they cover all these bases in their daily actions. In other right? words, so you're like, in other words, you're like, you're coaching against these seven traits. Like this is the ideal. And realistically, nobody is going to come prepackaged with a hundred percent score in all seven, but this is something that we can put up on the wall or bring up in one-on-one -on -one meetings or review at the end of the year and almost kind of score against, give ourselves some criteria to grade ourselves against, and then really pinpoint the stuff to work on with our project management teams and, and people. Definitely, definitely. Okay. It's a it's a framework just for that. It's also a framework to say, okay, on this project, I got to make sure I have these bases covered. And I've seen it where a, one person covers four bases, four or four archetypes, and the other person covers the other three, because together you have those filled. Yeah, and you can keep things on track. So we'll get into this, and it might make a lot more sense. So the seven archetypes, I'll list them first off and then we can go a little sure. bit deeper into each one one by one but <clears throat> number one is the communicator okay number two is the enforcer number three is the builder four is the leader five is the attorney six is the accountant and seven is the business developer okay so these behaviors, these, these, these mental models are, are what we can use to guide our actions on the daily basis when we get lost in the complexity of construction. It's a tool to help manage complexity. Okay? Let's, let's start with the communicator, number one. Okay. The communicator is exactly what it sounds like. It's the project manager who excels at communicating, at resonating, and at delivering what I call clear communication. Okay. Clear communication. Let's define that. It is when the idea in my head and the idea in your head is the same, exact same mirror image after I communicate it to you. Okay. So once I get my message across, 
And by the time we're done exchanging, it might be a one day thing or it might be a multi day thing, but you understand you, you can understand what I'm asking or I'm reporting to you and we're on the same page. The communicator is a great at syncing everyone up. Okay. So they communicate often. They communicate consist consistently. They communicate um, a structured in structured way. They communicate well. They not only understand their own communication patterns or their own personality uh, traits. They understand the person on the receiving end on on who. So they fine tune and deliver that message that so it's going to resonate with that specific person. Mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine at scale, the amount of communication that's happening on a construction project is, is insane. So at scale, it becomes so important to, that it gets right. Well, and I think people fall into this trap of thinking that because they're on their phone all the time, that they're good communicators. And it's like, that just means you talk a lot. It just, just means you're on the, like, that's actually not, that's not the same thing. I'd actually make the case that if you have to be on the phone all the time, you're a bad communicator because there's only, like you're not getting it across in the no. first time uh, yeah. or, or the first attempt. And so I I I love that point. I think the way you uh, describe it is like what's going on in my mind is the same as what's going on in your mind. Um, you know th that is a lot easier said than done. Um, it's about it's about like when you speak with people who are really good communicators, they're very concise. They're very good with, um, they've got a pretty strong vocabulary. Like they're not cavemen in terms of their, the words they're able to use, the lexicon they have stuff, the, their ability to sequence thoughts into sentences, sentences into paragraphs, their ability to give both context around an idea, meaning like, Hey, this is why this thing that I'm saying to you matters and content of the idea Hey, this is yep. the actual thing I'm saying to you, right? Yep. Doing both of those things simultaneously is really good. So that's like the outbound part. And then at the same time, they're, they're incredibly good at active listening and they're asking probing questions. They're repeating back. They're making sure I got it. And so I just think, uh, yes. you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if this this framework is, is sort of sequenced in terms of an, you know the, the order of importance, but it's it's just, it's interesting that we started at one with, with clear communication because I, I do think that that's, it's gotta be one of the, the, the most important pieces. What about the enforcer? Yeah. So the enforcer is, is also kind of what it sounds like. Um, it's the person who sets the stage for quality, you know, it was a yardstick for quality and how things are supposed to be done and enforces them. So on a job site, on a project, you know, there's many things that need to happen on certain dates. There's, there's standards, there's a way of doing things that, that, yield the outcomes that you're after. Um, and it's holding others accountable. It's being, being comfortable with holding others accountable to the standard of which they need to be done. At. And I, I'd say this is one that most people struggle with, think the most, mm -hmm. um, because it's hard. Sometimes you have to have challenging and, and difficult conversations when it comes to that. So, you know, I see a lot of people with job site signage on, it says, keep keep the, keep the site clean, keep it, keep it clean, clean as you go and keep everything organized and safety first and all this stuff. But you go walk on that job site and it's a mess, right? No one's actually enforcing the, the rules or the standards. The job site should be clean at all times. You know, you should, it, it should not be in, in shambles or disorganized. And what does that communicate if you're not um, holding that standard. The same thing if somebody tells you that they're going to get something done for you at a certain time, because that might be important. It might be real. The next guy in line might need to be relying on that information. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's setting those standards and it's properly holding people accountable for that. Have you found it, um, have you found it get easier for you as, as a, project manager, you know, you, you, you're building hospitals, you're building these huge healthcare facilities. Um, if people aren't cleaning up as they go, I'm sure that those things turn into an absolute dumpster fire, just to use the example you mentioned. But the question is, is more broad. Like when there is a, a line, an expectation that is set and mm -hmm. that expectation has been communicated and the person it's been communicated to agrees and nods and 
either it's a verbal commitment or it's a handshake or it's a signature on, on a whatever, and they're not hitting it. Like, how have you gotten better at that over time? Because it's people when it comes to, when it comes time to be like, hey man, this is the standard is the standard, and what you're showing me is not it. People yeah. skate around it, they avoid it, they don't say it. Like, what have you found useful to get better at that? So, great question. The easiest way to get better at that is to model it yourself. Okay. So be the example. If you want to lead, if you want to encourage discipline in other people, then you need to discipline yourself. Like you need to be the example of that. Then that conversation becomes way easier. Mm -hmm. And just, if you want to lead others, you got to lead yourself. And the second one is starting with why. So getting ahead of it from the beginning and actually explaining to somebody that why this is important and why this needs to be done because just telling somebody what to do is is not enough right we're humans we don't want to be told what to do all the time but we want to if it's if we can tie it to the overall vision of the project or the over the overarching goals on why it's important to you benji it's important to you to hold the to make the site clean because I care about your safety. I care about your production. I care about how efficient you are. Okay. So that makes enforcing a lot easier. So you have to, number one, be disciplined yourself, be the example and lead by example. So that way people know you're not full of, full of, Mm -hmm. okay. Number two is tie it to the why show people the overarching vision. I love that. Um, the third of of the seven archetypes you call the builder. So who is he or she? Yeah, so the builder is essentially the archetype of that of the old crusty superintendent that you've seen on job sites, right? The expert master builder can build anything, can know how to work drywall and knows every little detail of the process, electrical systems, MEP um production back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this problem getting back to the roots of the how and howing knowing how to schedule work and manage work efficiently in a lean way um, so that goes into understanding the work itself when you know the work and know the process from the guy who's actually installing it on the job site itself you're, you put yourself in that their shoes planning the work and managing the scope becomes a lot easier and you, you you get a whole bunch of more tools in your belt and it actually will support all the all the other archetypes it'll help you communicate better it'll help you enforce the rules better it'll help you lead better and help you manage your risk more so so knowing that is so important embodying that that master builder yourself going putting yourself out in the field and learning and watching and making sure that you know don't avoid that. Project managers can get really comfortable sitting in the office or in in the trailer where they know, you know, where they're in their comfort zone. A lot of times it's the field and, and being outside is, is, is not as comfortable. When as you, should. in your, in your lived experience, so I'm not, I'm not even asking you to give me like a theoretical abstract example, like literally in your career, what have you seen happen to project managers who do not have this trait? In other words, they don't have a ton of technical or hands-on skills themselves because they, they, they maybe didn't come from the job site. And then, and then once they became a project manager, they didn't supplement that gap. They just kind of focused on the Gantt chart, focused on builder trend or pro core. They're, they're, they're good at the tools. They're good at the pencil pushing, but they don't, act, yeah. they've never actually poured concrete. They've never actually assembled a building, whatever. Um, what have you seen happen to project managers with that major blind spot? Two things. Uh, number one, their, their influence kind of, kind of caps, right? right? They, they lose they're, the locker room, so to speak. They, they can't yes. motivate, they can't inspire, they can't influence. Yes. So that they hit a ceiling with their influence and their ability to influence both the project and the people. All right. So the outcomes and the people. So there's a ceiling that that you hit there and and that's not good. Number two is um, you you can't you lack uh, or you lose some ability to solve some complex problems. Um, so they won't be able to solve the problems either as quickly or or at all Mm -hmm. without some of that knowledge, you might have to go outsource that to somebody else. And that's okay too. Um, You know, as long as you, like I said, 
as long as you cover the bases somewhere. But if you really want to be that well-rounded project manager and that that one, you you want to lean that way. You want to get yourself that knowledge. You want to invest in those skills. This is a very interesting one because it is a fine balance, right? On the one, like you could over leverage or over emphasize the builder thing, and because you you you. You, we see that we see this in in in, in our clients businesses all the time a foreman mm-hmm. gets promoted to project manager but because being on the site being with the crew is what they know in this new position they have a tendency to kind of veer back to the site because it's familiar and it's comfortable and they can roll up their yeah. sleeves and fix the issue when in reality if you're managing a number of open job sites and complex schedules and, and budgets with a whole litany of customers um that actually really that actually can bite you in the ass. it's like it, it is a tightrope walk you need to have enough knowledge to be deadly to be dangerous mm-hmm. but you can't over lean on it and spend you, you do need to be in the office and on the phone and making decisions and analyzing numbers also so so don't you got to have it to to maintain that influence but you can also totally abuse it and and uh you know not cross your t's and dot your i's in other really important areas of the role so just a caveat to that builder one but i love that the fourth you mentioned was leader let's get into this one and that is the person you know it's who puts the team before themselves. Okay. So elevates the team and the mission before themselves. That's what leadership is, is, um, putting people first, empowering your teams, growing people, making others, making it about others and about the goal and the mission you're leading leadership in a nutshell is, you know, taking a team and taking a set of goals and achieving that goals through other people. Right. So leading others, uh, getting in front of issues, doing what is best for the team. It might mean doing thankless tasks without any recognition. That's okay. That's what leaders do. Um, and that's that's what it takes. And that's a big component of, of project management. It's, it's not all about you, you, you. It's about getting things done. It's about um, making sure that we we stay on track and doing what it takes to do that, putting the team first. Number five, you call the attorney. This one kind of surprises me. That sounds like it's you know, no, I, I, you know, attorneys aren't the most popular. Uh, why? Why is? Why did this one make the list? Yeah, yeah, they're not. They can't. They they people don't like bringing that up. Um, it can be uncomfortable, but in reality, um, th- what we do in this business, everyone's bound by contracts, right? We're bound from a, with a contract to our customer. We are we contract out work from from us to specialty trade partners. We're in contracts with vendors. Everyone's legally tied together through these contracts. And these contracts, they're not small. They're not they're sophisticated. They they certainly can be very complex. And they got tons of language and jargon and and all kinds of rules. But it really is being able to interpret the contract being able to use the contract as a roadmap rather than a weapon. You don't want to beat people over the head with it, but you want to use it certainly to keep yourself out of trouble, to make sure that you're staying in line with with the requirements of it. It's it's, it's the playbook. It's mm-hmm. the playbook for the game we play. And we got to make sure that we understand what our rights are and what how to keep our us and everyone else out of trouble. We want to keep the people under us out of trouble as well. Mm-hmm. You know, legal claims are no fun and they don't, they don't serve any purpose, but they're pretty, they're pretty common in, in our world. And, and we're all tied to these things. And the, the influential or the highly effective project manager is one that can take that complex language and kind of bake it into the systems and the processes that we, that we use on a day-to-day basis. So we can communicate it. We can make sure that people understand it and not fear it. Right. What what um, level would you encourage a project manager to get to? I mean, it's not we don't expect them to go to law school and pass the bar. But like how how much do you need to know to be effective in this? And I'm I'm, I'm kind of asking you in your world, like when you when you're reading a contract, do you understand all the complex jargon? Do you understand all the complex contingencies? Are you reading every every term and every subterm? Like just talk to me about how you kind of work through a contract before you go and lead the project. Yeah. Um, 
I don't, you know, I'm not word for word reading it, but definitely get yourself to the point where you're comfortable with it. You understand it. You understand how it's packaged and how, how it, how it works. You know, every contract you, for the most part is pretty much pretty similar when it comes to owners and subcontractors and things of that nature. Understand what each section's about and what, what the purpose of each section is. Um, I wrote a post about this in the in my newsletter about the common things and the at least the the no, the things that you need to know, um, but they're pretty much all the same. There's stuff in there about the schedule and how timeliness and the the schedule works. There's stuff about payments and how payment process works, the when, the who, and the where. Um, there's stuff about change. What happens when change happens? Because that's gonna happen on your project. The the when, the who, the where. Um, dispute resolution. What happens when, when there's an issue when we don't agree upon something? Okay. Well, understand that. Um, what happens when somebody's late? What happens when somebody doesn't send me something on time? What happens when a, a catastrophic act of God happens? Mm -hmm. All that stuff is in there. What happens with weather delays? What do I do? Who do I need to notify? Um, so you make a little cheat sheet, go through it, spend some time doing some deep thinking on it and make a little cheat sheet on on um, what's important and what you need to know and what you need to kind of bake into your your day-to-day -day processes. Uh, number six, accountant. Number seven, business developer. So let, let's hit these final two archetypes and then and then and then we'll wrap. But uh, tell tell me about the accountant. Yeah, the accountant. Um, exactly what it sounds like as well. You know, us as project managers on on these jobs, big jobs, small jobs, we manage millions of dollars, right? Millions of dollars are coming across our desk or touching it and we have to manage it wisely and appropriately. And we have to make good decisions with the budgets and stuff that we have. So that the accountant is leaning into the, to your analytical skill set and really diving into the numbers and, and knowing how to budget and forecast your spend and your, your income your cash flow so that you can run a healthy business, you can run a healthy project because that's essentially what a project is, is. This project is like a little mini business. It's a business that has the components of, of every other business. Uh, you know, it's got resources, it's got employees, it's got cash, it's got, it's got <clears throat> deliverables, it's got, you're providing a service. So understand how to, to run those numbers and how to control those numbers so you can make really good decisions with with your money and and to deliver your project. And lastly, yeah. business developer. And business developer is um, the thought and the idea that there's a behavior set that you also need to lean into because we don't just build one project. You know, we don't just do build one project and say, okay, I'm done. You know, there's needs to be another project after that and another project after that. We need to build a, a, a pipeline of, of projects. And, and the best way to do that is by performing really well and, and building a really good relationship on the current project you're on, the current project you're managing. So, what we talked about the six archetypes before that's really related to the the process and managing the complexity but the business developer goes a, a step further in in building that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the client with the stakeholders involved you know checking with them building that relationship getting to know them on a deeper level so at the end of the job when they're you know happy and and very satisfied with the end result they they also say you know what Kyle, he was a he was a really good dude too. He managed with integrity. He he cared about what I was doing. He checked in with me, he sent me a birthday text. He, you know, sent me, you know, wished me Merry Christmas and came and just popped in my office every now and then. And I I liked working with him and I would definitely do another one with him. I'm gonna keep him in mind if I have something else. And that's what business development is. You can business develop while you're also operating. And and I think the most successful project managers do do that as well as these other six behaviors we covered. If you were sitting down and potentially going to add someone to your team, you're going to hire a project manager because um, you got more work coming at you. What would be traits like, like, like 
I'm talking red flags, like absolute do not proceed if this person has this trait. What would be some major red flags that would that would cause you to pause and probably cancel the next interview? I think one of, one of them comes to mind is if I noticed a a, a, a deficiency in drive, like real lack of drive in, in that person, which that person really wasn't excited about getting up and accomplishing things and, and kind of moving things. Cause that's, it's kind of a big core of our business. We have to move things forward and, and making sure that things, things go on track and, and we're providing a, a really good service. It's complex of what we do. And, um, without drive, some of that other stuff is, is hard to, to get going. It's hard to go and learn these things and pick up these other little miscellaneous skills that we, that we need to have to make the job go well. A person with drive can, can go out and, and kind of answer all those questions and get the, get the information they need without, it's kind of like a self-starter. What else? Number two, number two is maybe not being able to work with people. Okay. That's a big one. This is a people business. Uh, we get things done through people. We build projects through people. We don't do this by ourselves. So if you can't work within a team, a team environment, um, I call it team ability, your, your team ability score. Um, you should have a high team ability um, trait in you. You should be able to work well with others, get along with others, not, not take things too personally. If, if something happens, you should be able to, to, to string all that together. And three would be um, a real deficient amount of, of emotional intelligence. Um, being, you know, getting offended really easy or, or, you know, once you hit a roadblock, you, you get real discouraged um, and like a setback could throw you off that that's going to be challenging as well. Um, you know, no, you don't need to be extremely high in emotional intelligence. That's, that's a big leadership trait, but that's something you can build up to. Mm. But if it's, if it's too low, that could be problematic. And then another fourth one that comes to mind is just being able to kind of juggle a lot. And that also comes with experience and skill. But if right off the bat, you see that, you know, having a lot on the plate is kind of uncomfortable and, and creates uh, like stalling, you know, it just, you freeze up and all that, that could also be problematic as well in, in this business. Kyle, you've said it all. Um, I, I love the summary. I love the seven archetypes thing. I think we'll, um, we will make that, that blog available. Uh, but just before we wrap here, if people, you're a really good, um, LinkedIn follow, you've got this really good Substack and newsletter going, maybe just give our listeners kind of your digital footprint. Where, where do they find you if they want to follow along or, or connect with you? Yeah. Um, first, the best place to follow me on social media is LinkedIn. Um, definitely, uh, give me a follow, connect with me there. I'd uh, love to, I, post daily on LinkedIn um, about the topics that we're talking about, leadership, project delivery, project management, construction tech, anything in those um, categories or join the conversation. Let's connect. Um, and then two is my weekly newsletter, the influential project manager. Um, that's on Substack. Uh, sure. There'll be a link somewhere. Come subscribe. I send a newsletter out every Tuesday morning um, and it's a deep dive topic on on one of those categories we talk about, it's uh, uh, project management, leadership and managing people, productivity, frameworks, tools, all that stuff to help you get um, the essentials of successful project leadership. Okay. I love it. Um, we will link that stuff in the description. Dude, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I really appreciate you laying all this out for us. It's been super insightful. Yeah. Likewise, Benji. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.